Breaking news this Monday, Britain's Prime Minister is in intensive care. The latest on Boris Johnson's condition and who is running that country now. New advice from Canada's public health officer. Wearing a non-medical mask is an additional measure. What is the most effective and simple homemade mask as Canada and the U.S. keep fighting over supplies for frontline workers? And that, of course, uh, is a two-way street. And personal protection equipment is running low. I don't sleep at night. Thousands apply for the emergency benefit. What about those who don't qualify? And the pressure mounts to ramp up testing in Canada. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We have lots of Canadian news to get to tonight and we will in just a moment, but we begin with breaking news from London. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in intensive care because his coronavirus symptoms have worsened. He's the first world leader we know of to become so seriously ill. Johnson tested positive 11 days ago. He kept working from number 10 Downing Street where he was in self-isolation. Now he's in much worse shape. His officials say he remains conscious and has been moved to the ICU in case he needs to be put on a ventilator. Crystal Gamansing has more on the fight of Boris Johnson's life. The British Prime Minister has been moved into intensive care. A spokesperson for the government says the move will allow him to be put on a ventilator should he require it. Earlier Monday, Boris Johnson updated his medical status on social media, writing in part, I went to hospital for some routine tests as I'm still experiencing coronavirus symptoms. I'm in good spirits and keeping up with my team. We last saw him Thursday out his door taking part in the clap for care workers. His condition has clearly deteriorated. We know he has been struggling with persistent cough and fever. However, when he was admitted to hospital Sunday, it was said to be non-urgent. He shared the news of his original diagnosis on social media March 27th. At that point, he said he was experiencing mild symptoms. His pregnant fiance also reported symptoms and was in self-isolation separate from the PM. Carrie Simmons last updated her status, saying she was on the mend. Johnson has asked that his unofficial second in command, Dominic Robb, be deputized to stand in for him. Johnson is 55 years old. We know people infected with the virus can't deteriorate quickly. The unit he is now on can provide more surveillance and stepped up medical intervention if it's required. The fact that Boris Johnson is in intensive care tonight, a shock for many people here in the UK, considering earlier in the day people were still being told it's just a precaution. Not surprisingly, an outpouring of support on social media, people wishing him well, and of course for a speedy recovery, Donna. All right, Crystal Demansing in London, thanks. There is news tonight about medical grade masks. President Trump had ordered the company 3M to stop importing masks it makes in overseas factories. He wanted them all made in America and to stop shipping any to Canada. Canada pushed back and tonight the company says it will import 166 million res respirators over the next three months to support healthcare workers in the U.S. And that plan will also enable 3M to continue sending U.S. produced respirators to Canada and Latin America, where 3M is the primary source of supply. There is another fight brewing with the U.S. after it reports hundreds of thousands of medical-grade medical masks bound for Ontario were held up at the U.S. border. That, of course, uh, is a two-way street. Both countries benefit from this, and both countries would lose out if... Uh, hurdles were to be put in the way of that flow of health care support between our two countries. And there is new advice today about wearing homemade masks in public, even if you have no symptoms. Public health officers in Canada now say they may provide some protection from infecting others, but they are no substitute for physical distancing. Mike Drolet on the developing story around masks. Okay, and then we just want to pull it up. There is no more sought-after item in the medical supply world right now. When a shipment of American-made N95 masks bound for Ontario was stopped at the border on the weekend, it set off a political tug-of-war 
Getting it across the border right now is, is very difficult. Right now, I, I understand there's two separate orders of close to four million masks, a half a million have been released. The fight over masks hit its crescendo last Friday, when U.S. President Donald Trump invoked the Defense Production Act, preventing 3M from exporting them to Canada and Latin America. We're very disappointed in 3M. They should be taking care of our country. On Monday, Ontario's premier was blunt. Frontline workers are running out. We're down to uh, about a week's supply. And it's not much better in Quebec. Les équipements on a actuellement 14 jours. Where they're down to under two weeks supply. 3M says it is able to manufacture about 100 million N95 masks per month, which would be a remarkable number except for the unprecedented global demand. Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland called the marketplace for masks the Wild West. France and Brazil are among countries complaining about being dramatically outbid on orders. All of which has led to Canada's chief public health officer to instruct hospitals to hold on to used masks that could be disinfected. And now telling the public homemade masks are better than no mask at all. Wearing a non-medical mask is an additional measure that we are considering to protect others around you. With so little inventory, she says all the medical grade masks are needed for frontline workers. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. The reason we're being asked to stay home if we can and stay physically distant from others is to stop the spread. If this virus can't reach you, it can't infect you, and you should assume that everyone has it. But the outbreaks and the level of testing varies depending on where you live in this country. Tonight, Eric Sorensen looks at what the data reveals at this stage. COVID-19 has moved across the country in stages. The exposure and incubation at first invisible. Then we saw hard evidence, illness started to spread. And now we are witnessing the third phase, the sobering statistics that Canadians are dying in greater numbers. Ontario's Premier, somber in emphasizing the dangerous time we've entered. And here in Ontario, we have 1,600 lives at stake this month alone. This is a matter of life or death. The impact of COVID-19 has been seen most tragically in seniors and extended care facilities across the country. We know that if it gets entered uh, into a long-term care facility, uh, we can have devastating results. Canada's first death from COVID-19 was recorded on March the 8th. It took more than three weeks to reach 100 deaths on March the 31st, but then just four more days to pass 200, and it was approaching 300 just one day after that. The sharp rise in mortality will continue, but for how long and by how much? It is a critical month for this country because it is more than numbers, these are lives. Two provinces are on the most worrisome paths. Ontario at 132 deaths as of today, Quebec now at 121. Both also have a high percentage of positive tests. In Quebec, 8.6%. In Ontario, 5.5%. A sign there may be more undetected cases. The average across the other provinces and territories, 2.2% positive tests. But testing has not been uniform across the country. Alberta has tested more than 14,000 per 1 million population, followed by Quebec and Saskatchewan. Ontario has conducted just over 5,000, fewer than half the tests per capita than the top three provinces. Experts believe widespread testing can save lives by tracking the spread of COVID-19. Those numbers are extremely helpful in, in providing uh, public health support for different places, but also at the individual level, it's extremely important to help guide individual management and individual care. Overall, Canada has done more testing than many countries. We've done relatively more testing than other places. Despite all of our challenges, we've done, we've done pretty well. But more needs to be done as Canada faces a statistical upturn in the numbers that ultimately matter most, our mortality rate. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Testing here in Canada has been ramping up, but it's not at the point where everyone with symptoms is getting a test. Canada is spending millions of dollars on new technology that will produce more and faster testing, but as Abigail Beeman reports, it's not here yet. 
phone booth testing sites in South Korea, a doctor who set up a makeshift test tent in Germany. Two countries faring relatively well in this pandemic. Both have high testing rates. Every single day we are doing more tests than the day before. We recognize that large-scale testing is a key element of flattening the curve. In Canada, more than 330,000 people have been tested, but there are countless people with symptoms who have not, with restrictions across the country on who is eligible due to a limited supply and priority for health care workers and vulnerable communities. And the country's biggest province, Ontario, with the most deaths, still lags behind. You want the test that you have and whatever you have with the on uh, populations where you are going to make a decision after you've um, actually uh, got the test result. So if you're just staying home anyways, uh, we're going to be prioritizing others. Ottawa still won't say how many test kits they've ordered, just that they're ordering more, trying to focus on domestic production in the face of a global shortage, such as their contract with Spartan Bioscience for quick test kits. So we're gearing up now to be able to produce millions of these tests per year in Canada. And now we are very soon going to be getting Health Can approval and starting to ship it out. And Canada's chief public health officer says they're looking at serologic testing in future, seeing if people carry the antibodies, were infected but recovered, to look at immunity. Either you're not sick or you're immune. Either one would be a yes. And I think that's where we need to go in order to make ourselves safe. And equally important as testing, as people try and figure out how to one day return to a normal life, contact tracing, the painstaking work of trying to figure out everyone with whom an infected person has come into contact and get in touch with them too. Ottawa is currently calling for volunteers across the country to help. Donna? All right, Abigail Beeman in Ottawa, thanks. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians have already applied for the federal emergency response benefit. Within the first nine hours of the online portal being open, at least 532,000 people applied for the benefit. That's only a fraction of the number of Canadians who have been laid off, of course, or had their hours reduced because of this pandemic. The federal government says an average of 1,000 applications are being processed right now every minute. There are others, of course, who don't meet these guidelines. The Prime Minister said today the program will still be fine-tuned. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson joins me now. Mercedes, walk us through who qualifies for the CERB and how much they'll get. So, Donna, with the website open today, those born between January and March can apply, and they've actually staggered who can apply each day based on your birth month because there are so many Canadians who are expected to flood the system. Let's walk folks at home through exactly what makes you eligible and what the CERB will do. It will provide $2,000 a month for up to four months. You have to live in Canada in order to qualify for it, and you must be at least 15 years old when you apply. Uh, you also have to have had an income over the past year of at least $5,000 and have had no income for 14 straight days. Now, in terms of who having lost their job can get this, well, anyone who's lost it as a result of COVID-19 or is not able to work because of the pandemic. That includes people who are ill, people who've been laid off, those who are at home looking after an ill family member, and Donna, also those who are at home looking after children now that schools are not in session. Mercedes, we know there'll be people who won't uh, meet these criteria, who won't be eligible for this. What is Ottawa doing for them? So the Prime Minister says that they know that there are holes in the system. And let's take a look at some of the people who don't qualify right now. Uh, and th this is people who are hoping to qualify, those who are working part time, those who have any kind of income whatsoever, even a little bit counts. You can't have any to qualify for the CERB. And on top of that, summer students, lots of people about to graduate from university looking for a job. We spoke to one woman who is a personal trainer. She has experienced between a five and seven thousand dollar decrease in her personal income a month but because she's still training people a little bit from home to try to make some money she's not eligible for this benefit and this is what she had to say about the government's current program i was really frustrated because i feel like as a small business owner one of the things we can do and we do well is that we are creative and we can innovate and we can pivot and i feel like i'm being penalized for doing that now, Donna, the government says that they know that there are holes in the system and they will be working to fix some of those in coming days. They've already addressed one of them, which is people who will be seeing their EI benefits end soon. They'll be transferred on to the CERB since they can't go out and find a new job in this environment. Donna?
Okay, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thank you. Well, if you're applying for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, you can do so on the federal government website, canada.ca, or you can call. The phone number is 1-800-959-2019. More than 10,000 Americans have now died of the coronavirus. Coming up, why officials there believe the death toll isn't telling the whole story. Close to 100 Canadians stuck on the Coral Princess cruise ship are heading home. Foreign Affairs Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne tweeted, Canadians who pass medical screening will be able to return to Canada on a flight chartered by Holland America. When they arrive in Canada, they will be screened again and then subject to mandatory 14-day self-isolation. Two people on board the Coral Princess have died from COVID-19. Twelve others tested positive. That's according to Princess Cruises. Health officials in the United States say the next two weeks are critical. The number of deaths in that country has now soared past 10,000. Public health officials have warned this week will bring more death and heartache right across America. Jackson Prosco reports. In this critical time, New York's hospitals are being pushed to their breaking point. Old people, young people, people are dying from this. It, it is lethal. 80% of the patients at this Brooklyn hospital are being treated for COVID-19. Nurses wear garbage bags and clean their clothes with sanitizing wipes. Doctors wear ski goggles. We're seeing a lot of younger, healthier patients, and they're coming in in a very critical state. With hundreds of deaths every single day, funeral homes and morgues are overwhelmed. There are warnings that official statistics may not capture people who die suddenly at home. That does happen in other epidemics, especially when the disease is similar to COVID, where people die quite suddenly if they do have serious complications from it. New York's governor sees faint signs of hope. The number of deaths was relatively steady for a second straight day. Hospitalizations have started to fall, but it's not clear what that means. There's also a real danger in getting uh, overconfident too quickly. This is an enemy that we have underestimated from day one and we have paid the price dearly. And other cities are just now seeing their numbers surge. There are 15,000 cases in the state of Michigan, now the third highest number in the U.S. And there are fears of a public health crisis in poorer rural areas. Those are the scary questions we all are wrestling with right now. It doesn't, it doesn't look promising for a lot of areas, uh, particularly the U.S. South. It, it does not look promising. It looks like we'll have probably higher hospitalization rates than uh, were anticipated. In hard-hit New York, they're preparing for every possible scenario. That could include the short-term burial of bodies in mass graves in some city parks. Donna? Unbelievable. Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Ahead, car makers adjusting production in an effort to help with this pandemic. This is a prototype for a ventilator designed by engineers at Tesla. It's made from redeployed car parts. The device uses a Model 3 electric sedan touchscreen, pumps, compressors, and an oxygen mixing chamber. It hasn't been tested or approved. Tesla is just one of the many companies trying to come up with innovative solutions right now. Bill Gates says he will spend billions to accelerate the development of a COVID-19 vaccine. The Microsoft co-founder says the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will have factories built for seven potential vaccines. He acknowledges a lot of money is going to be wasted as it's likely only two of those vaccines will end up being effective. But the financial boost will accelerate the whole process. Up next, can you get COVID-19 from animals? More answers to your coronavirus questions. As we learn more about this virus, the response evolves too, and your questions about it keep coming. Jeff Semple has the answers to some more of them tonight. One of the latest COVID-19 cases caught even health experts by surprise. It surprised everyone because that hadn't been documented before. This tiger at New York City's Bronx Zoo, the first animal in North America to test positive, leaving many cat owners curious. 
My name is Melody Tortenert. I'm from Revelstoke, BC, and I'm just wondering about the transmission between animals and pets and, and humans. Coronaviruses have long lived in animals, often originating in bats. Several strains, including MERS and SARS, have then made the leap to humans. And in a small number of COVID-19 cases, humans have been infected felines and dogs. But there isn't clear evidence that the dogs, for example, can transmit to humans. Strangely, none of the staff members at the zoo has reported any symptoms, leading viewers to ask this. This is Lena in Ottawa. My question is about the transmission of COVID-19 by asymptomatic carriers. Iceland tested nearly 5% of its population, regardless of whether they had symptoms, and nearly half of those who tested positive were asymptomatic. And we've heard about transmission of this infection in people that are going to develop symptoms but haven't yet developed symptoms yet. It's unclear to what extent that's happening in the community. That uncertainty prompted Canada's top doctor to change course, advising people even without symptoms to consider wearing non-medical homemade masks. Hello, my name is Kelly McCallum and I live in Morinville, Alberta. Uh, many of these masks are designed with a pocket to hold a filter in them and the suggestions vary from using a coffee filter to cutting up furnace filters and vacuum bags. Number one, I think if you put those filters in place, they might be hard to breathe through. <laughs> On the other hand, if I use my, my usual scarf, my winter scarf, uh, which is quite easy to breathe through, <laughs> Uh, it, it probably isn't going to be terribly effective. So a lot depends on the material. Here's how you can make your own face covering in a few easy steps. Canadian and American public health officials now recommend using 100% cotton material, like an old t-shirt with elastic bands to create face coverings. But I always urge people to remember that these are not a substitute for the most important things, which are washing your hands, not touching your mouth and nose, and, in general, staying out of public. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. And we want to keep Jeff busy. He's going to continue to consult with experts and try to answer your questions. So send them to your questions at globalnews.ca. And on our website, you'll find a special page dedicated entirely to COVID-19. That's at globalnews.ca slash coronavirus. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. One of the many things that's been cancelled are citizenship ceremonies. But last week... A special virtual citizenship ceremony was held for Adolf Ning. He is a professor at the University of Manitoba. Canadian officials say his new citizenship allows him to perform essential work related to combating COVID-19 and saving Canadian lives. Thanks to him and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.